Good afternoon. I'm here to, um, I hope, change the focus of the conversation a little bit and, and start us talking about the future of sense making, something that we call human 2.0. So about two, two and a half years ago, um, Thomas Friedman, the author, sat down with uh, the director of Google X, Astro Teller, and they were, you know, having an after-dinner conversation. He got on a napkin, and he drew on the napkin the J-curve of technology. We've seen this curve today before, right? So he drew the J-curve of technology, and he said, here's where technology is going. That's actually rate of change, right? So it's going up, and humans have stayed flat, right? We are, we are in a long evolutionary time scale, right, in order, to, in order to change. And so the problem is, is that we need to get there, right? We need to get and join technology up that, up that J curve and actually change something about human adaptability. We know that technology is not easy to keep up with. All of us sort of have that experience. But the problem is, is that we've actually relied on technology to actually make us perform better. And so what happens when technology starts to surpass us and human adaptability remains flat? So my argument or our thesis is that the future of sense making requires us not only to embrace technology as we are all doing, but actually enhance human brain function so we can get further up that curve. So actually last night, I was, I, I was here for the dinner last night and somebody came up to me and they said, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I, I assumed that they didn't mean that in a, you know, accusatory sense. I sort of meant, you know, I, I figured that they meant, you know, what are you doing here? So I actually have a really interesting background, right? So um, I'm currently the chief science officer of the Platypus Institute. The Platypus Institute actually takes some of the things that you've heard about neuroscience and cognitive science and translates them into applications. I call myself an applied neuroscientist. So I am a neuroscientist. I'm also a former DARPA program manager. We heard a little bit about DARPA today from, from Brian Pierce. Brian and, actually, uh, and I were actually colleagues together. Um, I I've been a, a vice president of innovation at a small business, and then we were acquired, and I was actually the chief technology officer of a large defense business. So it's actually a pretty rapid trajectory now going back from academia through the government to small business to large business. And I think I actually have a really interesting view of how we are approaching this sort of future of sense making and neuroscience approach. Um, so I, I call it, like I said, applied neuroscience, right? And, and I want to tell you one sort of miracle. We heard a lot of miracles uh, today in in the conversation with Bill Newsom about neuroscience, right? We, we found, we're finding out all these amazing opportunities and things that we're discovering, but I'm gonna tell you one key factor that I think is particularly important, and it's called neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity actually allows us to change our brains well into adulthood. This is very important, right? When I was a graduate student, I was a, a, I was a young neuroscientist, right? We, we knew a couple things, right, at that time, like no, what we call no new neurons, right? Adults couldn't grow new neurons, right? So that was one thing. And then everything was primarily fixed, right? You know, traits about yourself, maybe psychology, maybe a way that you reacted to something. Learning was something that was seen that happened when you were younger, but not necessarily when you were older. And this is just patently untrue. So the first thing is that there is plasticity in the adult brain. New neurons do grow. They grow in specific places in the brain, but they do generate new neurons, and we can actually influence how that happens. And then the second thing is that we have plastic brains that can continue learning into adulthood. And so I want you to, to sort of like, if there's one thing that you're going to sort of take home from the talk, think about neuroplasticity and think about the ways that we can change our brains, both in the future of sense making, in our own lives, and in our workplaces. So when I think about applied neuroscience, I think about two things. I think about sort of near-term things, ways that we can actually sort of upgrade the brain with technology. And then I think about future-facing things, where maybe we start to merge ourselves with technology. So we have a concept at Platypus that we call human 2.0. And the human is divided in half for two reasons. One is because we have this core capabilities that we are going after in the short term, right? So short-term goals and emerging capabilities that we're starting to look at. 
We do that for a practical purpose, sort of framing the programs that we go after, but we do it also for a very important sort of mission-focused perspective that we have within the Institute, which is never losing sight of you know, that future space. I've actually called them, I call them, you know, you've heard of moon shots, you know. I call them moon overshots. The moon is just a little too close for me. I'm not sure if I'm going to hit Mars, but I'm, gonna, I'm definitely shooting past the moon, right? And so we'll actually talk about some of these capabilities as we go. But let's focus on this first half, right? Let's focus on these near-term things that we can look at. Uh, things like heightened intuition, focus, creativity, memory and processing capability, right? These are some things that we can actually start turning the knobs on right now. So I'm going to give you two examples from one of my previous DARPA programs, right? So this stuff is actually pretty old, but it's pretty new from the way that we're actually able to, to implement the, the technology, right? So I had a program at DARPA called Accelerated Learning. In the accelerated learning program, we asked two questions. One was, do the brains of experts look different than the brains of novices? And at the time we asked the question, this was a very revolutionary question, right? Like, wow, you think there are brain structural or, or signaling differences between experts and novices? We hypothesized there was. And then if there are differences between novices and experts, can I do something to the novice to get them further up that curve? Not necessarily turning them into expert, instant experts, right? But actually accelerating that expertise. So one of the first things we did was actually look at marksmanship. So this is a task that's very common and very popular across the military. Everyone has to do it. You all have to be sort of experienced and expert marksmen. What it turns out is that these snipers actually have a repeatable expert brain state that they're able to enter at will. It's quantifiable, it's measurable, and you can measure it in real time, right? So they control their breathing, they control their heart rate, and then they actually have a measure in the front of the brain, uh, a particular frequency, that they can actually reproduce when they get in the zone, right? We've all sort of had that sense of like being in the zone, right? So they're able to put themselves in that zone at will. What we then did was actually used a neurofeedback paradigm, so actually showed people their own brain activity in real time and trained them very simply using simple feedback, haptic feedback or auditory or visual feedback to actually reproduce that brain state and actually train themselves to get into the zone. What happened was their performance improved without them ever having to practice any more than, you know, sort of normally going to the range and, and doing some shooting like they were. So the, literally, the brain training alone improved their feedback, which is really important because this is, while it's a one example, it's a template for how we might think about using neurofeedback to actually improve performance. Another thing that we did, same program, was actually look at teams. So same kind of question. Do the brains of expert teams look different than the brains of novice teams? We actually started this work with the Submarine Learning Center. So the Submarine Learning Center had these expert teams that would come in and do this very difficult navigation task. You know, they had to navigate through this channel and make sure they didn't run into any barriers and avoided other boats and things that were sort of in the area. Expert teams, you know, we've all had this sense, right? Have you ever had the, the, the conversation or the feeling that you're on the same wavelength with someone, right? You're kind of clicking, you're, you're kind of in the zone together, right? That's the same thing that expert teams did. They actually synchronized both their physiology, not necessarily their heart rate, but their heart rate variability and some other measures, as well as their brain signatures. Their brains actually started to fire together and react to stimuli together. In addition to that, expert teams were actually able to recover from mistakes much faster than novice teams. Novice teams, you know, made a mistake and then, you know, ended up sort of going off into a little rat hole or ended up going back to their individual tasks. Whereas expert teams made a decision, maybe they made a mistake, they shook it off, they reset themselves. They had a resiliency that I think, you know, is very important for looking at in terms of business. So the, the, that was the work that we did back in the Accelerated Learning Program. Similarly, our colleagues at Advanced Brain Monitoring actually did work with 
MBA students solving those like really gnarly business questions. Like, you know, you have to, you know, it's either you close this factory or all these kids go into child labor or, you know, really like kind of those unsolvable problems, but you have to come up with a business solution. And what we found here again was that not only did the teams again start to, the successful teams start to synchronize, you could actually see leadership emerge within the group, right? People started engaging and paying attention to certain people, and those people emerged from that group as the leaders of that group as they came together to work on that task. So what we think is so interesting is how do we as teams sort of foster this you know, sort of zone and, and flow creation. We're interested in how we can actually cause creativity in teams. How do you stimulate innovation? We believe that by using and applied neuroscience techniques, we can actually get people to synchronize faster and perhaps generate ideas even more quickly. So these are things that we think can happen sort of like right now. So I'm gonna go to the other half of the AN 2.0. And I'm going to talk about the emerging capabilities, right? So we've all heard of, you know, sort of, you know, thinking about uh, uh, sensory enhancement. Today we heard a great talk about using haptic stimulation. Um, there are a lot of ways that we can actually expand our sense making as humans. And some of those are a little kind of far out there, right? And some of them are things that I think we're all thinking of and maybe, and maybe pondering, but are not too, not too far off. Um, so sense making in terms of interfaces. Certainly people are familiar with the cochlear implant, right? The ability to use an external sensor implanted into the cochlea, which is a part of your ear, right? The inside of your ear that actually uh, transduces sound, right? So that's, a, that's an example of, a, of an implant of a sensory interface that's been around for a very long time. Uh, we have a, a gentleman down here who is actually someone who has implanted an antenna in his head, in his skull, because he was born without the ability to see color. He only sees in grayscale. And so he was an artist, and one of the things he wanted to do was actually experiment with his own sort of sense. So what he did was he had an antenna implanted in his skull that actually can sense color, infrared as well, and it transduces sound waves into his head, and he interprets those now as color, which is a really interesting sort of sensory enhancement for an individual. This sounds a little far out, but there are ten, literally tens of thousands of people across the globe that have implanted uh, magnetic sensors in their fingertips or other types of, you know, sort of orienting devices. People have RFID tags embedded in their, in their arms and, and hands. So it's a very interesting space when we think about the future of sensory enhancement. These things that were once sort of very far out there are now much closer. My colleague Adam Piori just put out a book, The Bodybuilders, in which he actually goes through sort of sensory enhancement that people are going through, whether those are robotics or prosthetics or, or others. So think about that from the perspective of sensory enhancement. We talked about this this morning. The idea, it came up, uh, Centaur chess and then freestyle chess came up. I think one of the most interesting ways that we're actually going to augment ourselves as humans is the combination of machine AI and other systems with human capabilities. We sort of had a little discussion about the centaur chess this morning and deciding that people could do it because it was fun and so maybe the centaur wasn't such a big idea. But I actually think it's very fundamental because if you, if you listen to Gary Kasparov explain centaur chess, what he says is having the machine allowed him to be more creative in the ways that he actually expressed himself during the chess game. And so let's think of the ways that we can free up our own creativity by using AI systems. Now, it's not just a, a flipping you know, back and forth between you know, something that's solving a simple task for you. Imagine it's a very complicated planning task. One of the things that AI is great at is giving you uh, analysis of alternatives. And so maybe there's a way to, to sort of combine these into, into multi-sensory systems. I have a vision of of where we're headed with this. Again, we talked about this, Brian talked about this as well in terms of DARPA, in terms of teams. I was on the uh, Defense Science Board study on autonomy, and the one thing that we talked about was trust. 
The reason that we are able to form teams with one another and work together is the concept of trust. And so how do you build trust across individuals, whether they're AI team members or human team members, and, and start to do that? Part of that is the conversation I think that we need to have around this space. But trust is actually something that we build. It's not magic. It's actually something that we build together. And so I think we need to look at ways of teaming uh, to, to sort of approach that. And finally, I want to leave you with, uh, you know, sort of my perspective on um, the future of sense making with, our, with, with all of us as a team, right? So again, we talked about collective intelligence this morning. Now I'm not necessarily talking about uh, you know, an augmented or AI team member, but the future of sense making as us, as a, as a whole collective intelligence piece, right? But one of the things that, that has disheartened me, I will say, about social media is that I think in some ways it's actually fractionated us, right? It, we've, we, we continuously sort of potentially reinforce messages that we're sort of hearing among our groups. And so we're talking, I've been talking with my neuroscience colleagues about ways of actually increasing empathy, ways of building conversations across people that are very separate from one another. How do we rehumanize? How do we reconnect? And so if I can leave you with a final thought, on uh, sort of the human 2.0 and future of sense making is that I think one of the ways that we'll see the most impact from the future of sense making is ourselves coming together in our work environments, in our family environments, and in our lives to actually come together to be that, that new sense, that collective sense. <laughs>